after traveling with all those van friends for so long, we're off into the unknown again on our own. And I never really appreciated the feeling of safety I had when I was with them. I think we're safe still, but it's definitely a feeling you get. It's really nice traveling with Snow and Kurt. Being on our own again, it feels great out here. Whoa! <laughs> We are in a work zone, which is a huge work zone. And the guy in front of me was passing a really slow truck. So I thought, okay, you know, he's doing it, he's a local, and I go for it. Sure enough, boom, police right in front, waving us down. I have to, he stops super quick. I have to stop super quick behind him. There's a truck behind us. But, you know, the second police officer did motion me over, and he motioned me out of the car, showed me, look, this is a double yellow line, this is very serious. It's a $600 fine. <gasps> he said, here, it's 325,000 colonists. And I just started talking, and I, I just didn't stop talking for a while, and I was really surprised it worked. But we got out of there, with just a warning. Um, basically, I told him, I'm very sorry, you know, I wouldn't have done that. It's just that the car in front of me was doing it. I saw it was a local, and a lot of times in a different country, the laws can be confusing, and so I was trying to do like the locals were doing by passing this slow truck. It seemed very safe. I was being very safe. I only did it because the guy in front of me was doing it, and I asked him if we could leave it at a warning this time, and he said, I didn't know the word for warning, you know? <laughs> so he says, yes, yes, warning. I'm like, well, you know, now that I know and I'm very sorry and I wouldn't have done it, I repeated that part, uh, you know, if we could just leave it here and I would really appreciate it. And he says, okay, <laughs> drive very safe in the future, don't pass a double yellow line. <gasps> but double yellow line plus work zone, Definitely. I, I'm not yeah. going to do it again. Yeah, I mean this work zone is really like clearly delineated and it felt super safe. The people in front of us weren't locals either. Right. He yeah. Said, he said no. They were Americans too. Yeah. <laughs> and they let them go too? Yeah, they let them go. Oh my god, and he was still talking to me for so long. I know, I don't know why he asked you to get out of the car. <laughs> I get, you know what? She was probably like, oh sorry, I don't speak in, I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> yeah, right? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Because the other officer goes back like, does this one speak Spanish? <laughs> yeah. Oh, he did. He said, does this one speak Spanish? That's so funny. I'm so glad we got out of there, man. Zero Oof, we're so lucky. Thank goodness you talked your way out of that one for us. Oh my God, we got lucky today. Yeah. So tonight we're heading to Laguna Ule, which is supposed to be a super nice camp spot. A lot of people on iOverlander say it's not to be missed. Tomorrow we'll be able to explore the lake. And uh, yeah, we're in the mountains again. It is 71 degrees. We've been so hot at the beach, so we're stoked to be cold up here in the mountains for the night. Good morning from Lago Ule. It's raining today. We got up at about an hour ago, but now it's about 9.30 and I'm not sure if we're gonna do this hike down to the lake in the rain. But the lake has been beautiful from last night. It was super quiet, super safe. Oh geez. There we go. The sketchy road getting out of Lago. Uh -oh.
Ah, this tree is massive. Reminds me of being in the redwoods or something. Just at the top, it's not enormous, but the bottom, these buttress roots, huge flat roots that hold the weight. Wow, <laughs> look at this little nook in it. Holy, I think you could set up camp right there. This is our first stop in the Rio Celeste area and it's definitely going to be full of natural beauty. But some roads that are definitely a bit steep, potholy. But this is uh, one of those sites that everybody says is just worth checking out. Rio Celeste. Holy, yeah! This tree! That lady was really nice. She told us how the tree's over 700 years old. It's a Saiba tree, characterized by those huge buttress roots. Besides that, she was saying something about the Nobel Peace Prize, and that since people from all over the world come to see it, that's why they call it the Tree of Peace. Oh, uh, we found the Rio Celeste. Look at that. Oh my gosh, I can't believe how blue that is. How blue. Oh my gosh. So this is our first look and we've come to a free spot so we can go for a walk with some Brita, hopefully tie her out today and then we'll go to the national park tomorrow. Wow, so the national park here seems really cool because they'll explain why the water is so blue. Apparently it has to do with aluminum in the water or something, some kind of that that with the pH of another stream, when they combine, it turns it really blue. But you can't actually swim in the national park. Um, and also the trails uh, can be muddy, I guess. So if it's uh, free and you can swim, come check out the river this way. Rio Celeste, named for the stunning blue color. Wow. We saw one river kind of like this. That was in Guatemala. And Sombrita and Graham got to go on a walk there after Samuk Jampe. the National Park and it closes at 2 p.m. It opens up again at 8 a.m. We're gonna be able to check it out tomorrow. We could have camped over in the National Park but it would be about 2,000 to 6,000 colones and I mean we can camp for free right here with a view of the river so I might as well stay here. Good morning! We're about to head over to Tenorio National Park to learn more about this Rio Celeste and why it's just such a beautiful blue color. We're super excited for this hike today. Well, we're all packed up and ready to go. Look where this guy is up here. You're too cute, my boy. And then Sombrita. Not allowed either, unfortunately. But it's nice and cool out here. Wow, it would be sweet to see a taper. Fingers crossed. We're on the portion of the Rio Celeste hike where you just walk in a straight line until you get to the cool stuff. It's not muddy like some people said so far. And we thought we'd tell you guys how we find all this stuff. Cause that's a really huge part of traveling is just knowing what you want to do and all that research. The main way we do it is we have a Google map where we save stuff. It's like a shared Google map between both our phones and our computers. So anytime we add a spot, the other person can see it on their phone. And when we're going to a new area, I'll look at that map. And then I'll look at the map of iOverlander. 
cross-reference um iOverlander is an app for for finding spots to camp so but people also put in tourist attractions on it or little known places that they can go on the way our Google map is also used for when people give us recommendations on where to go we'll just put it in our Google map and I usually write a note on who suggested it later on we can send them a picture or thank them so last night I was I was cross-referencing the Google Maps the iOverlander and then trying to figure out I think we want to go scuba diving so hit up a ton of companies on WhatsApp which is kind of the main way of communicating down here because you don't have to use like text or uh, or minutes you just use your data plan and so then yeah you hit up a bunch of places you know and figure out how how you can book what they're offering and, and then you're good to go out here living the life and then the last resource I forgot to mention is uh, travel books we like to get the travel books used they're really cheap that way <laughs> <laughs> if the places are still around you know that they're good <laughs> <laughs> and my uncle actually had a really good book we got to his place here and that's the Fromers. The first Fromers book I've had access to. Super high quality book. All the animals and sites. So that's kind of step zero is looking through books and websites and putting that all on the Google map. Take all that back. Best way, local recommendations. <laughs> Whenever a local recommends something, you better do it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is gonna be a sweet path down to the waterfall I think. Really cool. You ready to head down, love? Yep. <laughs> 500 feet down and then back up. <laughs> wow, you can really hear the roar of the waterfall coming up. This waterfall is definitely one of the main attractions of the park, but I'm really excited to see up ahead where the water changes to the blue color and the explanation of that. But wow, this is a great waterfall. It's been raining lately, so we were worried it might not be as blue, but it's looking really good. Stop Mirador. Wow, past the waterfall here has been relentlessly uphill. To get into this park, it was 12 US dollars each, eight or 9,000 colones. And we also had to pay to park, which was 2,000 colones. So, uh, about three bucks. All in all, not a bad hike. It looks like they've really conquered the mud problem that a lot of people talk about online by putting down a gravel rock here. And I was expecting something like Cerro Chato where we were slogging through mud the whole way. Or the other day at Mazdaquillo. Yeah, with Kurt. Mirador in Spanish means like a viewpoint, a lookout. And I guess it's all covered by jungle, but this is the volcano Tenorio under the clouds there. And a bunch of its craters should be visible here too. Um, I guess here's what it, what it would look like. So the first crater of Tenorio, second crater, and then this Montezuma crater over here. Well, we're pretty familiar with this after being in Arenal, not being able to see the top but we did catch a peak of it at one point and down we go again yeah you can smell the volcano now and that's part of why the water's blue they call this part the blue lagoon wow this is even more colorful than below 
really beautiful here. Look how clear the water is. Now all we need is a little tapir to come in for a drink and I feel like we'd be really in the middle of nowhere. What do you think? Really beautiful how you can see through so easily. Wow, this blue river is also a hot spring. Look at this bubbling, churning water. You kind of wish you could go for a dip. You kind of wonder if you would die because it's too hot. Maybe that's why it's not allowed. <laughs> this happens quite a bit at hot springs where the moss from the steam starts to grow on the rocks around it. And for this river, it just makes such a beautiful setting since the water is so blue, the rocks are so green. It smells like chicken noodle soup. <laughs> Hanging bridge. We're crossing right now the rivers that combine to create the Rio Celeste. So you see here, you don't see the blue, but you see boiling water right there. Ah. Another mud mitigation strategy. Well done, park. Weather has become more unpredictable, but we have not experienced mud, so we were fine in the, our regular hiking shoes. It's so blue. Yeah, so this one you can definitely tell is, is a lot bluer than that last tributary. Wow, this is impressive. Here you can see where the color of the river changes to be that beautiful blue. The explanation is that this is a mixing point of two rivers. You got one on the left there and one comes in here. Here's the mixing point. And this river is carrying a lot of uh, aluminosilicates which is a particle formed by aluminum, silicon, and oxygen. And here where the rivers mix, for some reason the pH changes. I guess one of these rivers must be more of a hot spring river. And so here where they mix, that causes those particles to enlarge because of the pH. And a lot of them drop to the bottom, or some of them. You can see here like a white sediment on the bottom. But the ones that remain in the water cause a optical phenomenon called my scattering in physics, which creates the blue color. Kind of like when you look through rain in a rainbow, the water gets split into different colors of light. Pretty crazy to see this point right here. Really interesting. So we walked a little over two miles and now we're gonna head back to the van and go back to the spot where we slept last night so we can go swimming in the free part of the river. <laughs> I read that the water color can come back in as quick as a couple hours after a heavy rain here. So even if it's rainy season, you might be able to come check this place out. That's so cool. Woo, really glad we came in the morning because it's starting to rain. And there's quite a few people here. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have to put away the camera, but Emily's got this dry bag here. And we got this uh, rain, rain cover, cover for our other bags, so should be fine. Back to the van. Let's see our buddies. Hola. Hola, Sombrita. You just popped right through there, huh? Where's Grammy? Sombrita. Oh, Grammy's still in his loft. So right down the road from Tenorio National Park where we just were to check out the Rio Celeste is, is a very nice swimming hole. Are you happy? So yeah, we can go for a swim now. Yeah, this spot's here, nice little rock pool. We haven't gone too far at all from the bridge already. I'm loving it up here. Yeah. Maybe let's go in a little further.
time to head to our new campsite for the night. Unfortunately, last night when I was trying to make some dinner, the stove ran out of propane. It happens every couple months. Uh, traveling in the hot weather makes it happen a little bit less because we don't really use the stove as much. We run out of propane every two to three months. So now we have to go and find a propane place. So we got to get this propane tank out here. It's pretty simple. We have this bar, keeps all the stuff in. I think we did that in Mexico. And then here, this is what actually holds the propane. Uh, so you have to undo this part here. Oh, easy this time. <laughs> so now Danny's gonna take the propane tank over to the guy to get refilled. And I write on our little piece of paper how often we get propane. Whoa, so we lasted three months this time. So I guess at this spot they don't let me go in there. Not sure if it's due to COVID or just safety. I don't mind at all. I'm sure he'll come back with the receipt and I'll pay him then. He knew exactly the size. We got that tiny tank because it's slightly more safe. It's not really safe to have a tank in your vehicle. But we always shut it off at the tank when we're not cooking and that is the number one safety as well as we have a propane detector and a carbon monoxide detector so they actually had me go in there to pay it's uh, 1700 colones about so that works out to be just three dollars to fill it which is what we're accustomed to so now he handed me back the tank basically just put it back and Test her out. Perfect. There we go. That's some awesome. clean propane. And then we shut it off down here. Usually whenever we first get propane, the flame lasts a lot longer. So, yep, that looks like we have a new tank. And now it's already off here. Now we shut it off here. The There's knob. no propane in the line. So, Everything's safe. All right, good job. Woohoo, we're good for another three months. Thank you guys so much for watching. See you next time when we head over to the other Costa Rican coast.